Uh, so it's wonderful to be here. I, I've been by Boulder Bookstore probably a thousand times in the last five years. And I always dream one day of actually giving a talk here. So to be standing here and giving a talk is, is amazing. And even more amazing is here is my friends, my family, my teacher. Um, it's, it's really deeply moving and quite a bit intimidating. <laughs> so I'm here tonight to talk about Heartblown Open. And this is a biography of Junpo Dennis Kelly Roshi. And I'm quite honored because he is actually here this evening. So I would like to uh, have him stand and just acknowledge him briefly. So the way this book came to be, it was 2007, and um, I went to an event in North Boulder at Boulder Integral, and there were a whole bunch of teachers and other people there, and I met this very interesting man there, and he was kind of like part sailor, part philosopher, part Zen master, so this kind of dirty talking very Ooh. cerebral, <laughs> very embodied kind of, kind of guy. And I had never really met someone that was a Roshi that had that sort of particularly interesting, energetic characteristic. And uh, so I was intrigued. So over the course of 2007 and 2008, I went to a few talks and a few lectures and a few day-long retreats. And um, there were a couple things that really stood out. The first thing was that he was Irish, which was really great. So to find an Irish Roshi is, because I'm, I'm Irish, so you know, then you've got, you've got the Zen and the Enlightenment, but you also have the whiskey and the ales, and so, so that was nice. But in addition to that, he, he had a pretty radical message, which, which really kind of floored me when I first heard it. And it had to do with these ideas around anger and shame. So one of his central teachings is that anger and shame, which I always consider primary emotions, that they're actually not really emotions, not primary emotions, they're reactions to emotions. And his teaching was that there's, there's this deeper feeling that initially arises, a sense of deep caring that we normally have, and then we choose anger or we choose a shame response, consciously or unconsciously. And so it was this kind of radical teaching around ownership of feeling, that no one could make me angry, that I choose anger. And um, he also had an equally radical teaching around awakening or enlightenment. And it was the same sort of a teaching, where that we don't, awakening doesn't come to us, we don't get it from a teacher, we don't train to the point that we finally find it, but we actually claim our awakened state that just like we claim to be in a conscious relationship, or we claim to react in a way that's mature, we also claim to be, we claim our awakened state, we, we claim to be enlightened. And it doesn't have to come from anywhere outside of us. In fact, it can't. So these were kind of radical teachings for me, to have this, um, this, this emotional piece, this, this, this emotional integrity piece, and this awakening piece. And to have them integrated, I had never really seen anyone that taught that way before, or brought a teaching like that before. So, at the time, I was in a relationship, former girlfriend, and it was a very challenging relationship. It was, it was a wonderful relationship in a lot of ways, but it was, I was constantly getting triggered, I was constantly getting angry, I was constantly being ashamed, I was constantly giving away my power, and, and it, was, uh, it was very challenging. So after seeing Junpo speak for, for a couple months, I decided to, to get him one-on-one. -on -one. He was in town. And so I asked him if we could meet one-on-one, -on -one, and he agreed. And so this is what happened. <clears throat> in the winter of 2007, 2008, I was involved in a very intense and challenging relationship. When Kelly was back in Boulder not long after the new year, I requested that we meet, in part so that I could come to understand my role in this intimate relationship more clearly. He invited me up to a mountain home outside of the hills of Boulder, where, we, where he was staying. I drove up, parked, and was greeted by Kelly, Jumpo, who was wearing plain black pants and the top common in Zen. He calls them his jammies, actually. Come on in, he said casually, 
and directed me to a place <clears throat> where he had set up two meditation cushions. I took my seat, and Kelly sat down across from me. We made small talk about our lives. I told him of my recent divorce, my life as a recently published author of fiction, and the turbulence of my current relationship. He shared some stories of his own, and we laughed and connected like two old friends. Between us sat a beautiful Japanese bowl. And with a straightening of his back, Kelly struck it with a wooden handle. So, he said, his face growing more serious, is there such a thing as pure listening? Pure listening, I asked, smiling. Like what? Can you just listen, he asked. Simply receive the sound of this bowl ringing. I listened and nodded unsurely. So I really, I kind of wasn't getting it. Can you just listen? Yeah, I guess, you know, sure. <laughs> so he looked at me, he dropped in a little, and he said, just stop the sound. Go ahead, just stop the sound. Okay, I said, getting the point. I can't stop hearing the sound. I'll ask again. Is there such a thing as pure listening? outside of your ego and outside of your story? Is there such, such a thing as listening without valuation, without form, without thought? He struck the bowl forcefully as his eyes, blue and remarkably clear, bore into mine. I heard the sound coming from the bowl, entering my ears and registering in my brain. He struck it again, and I began to feel the ringing in my body as if I was listening with my heart, not my head. Is there such a thing as pure listening? He asked quietly. I did not respond. Gradually, as I listened more closely, the beautiful bowl's vibration began to change. I no longer perceived the sound striking my ears and entering my brain. Instead, I felt the sound radiating out from my heart to the bowl and from the bowl back through me. He struck the bowl again. I was the sound itself, and the sound was me. There was no listener and nothing to hear. There was only the undulating vibration moving through the room. No subject and no object, just listening. I nodded my head very slowly. Good, he said, tracking me. Good. Now give me your eyes. I looked up. We sat a foot apart for nearly an hour, eyes locked onto each other, Junpo striking the bowl every minute or so. What is this place? He asked eventually, his voice reverberating deep in my chest. Describe it to me. It's vast, I whispered, barely able to speak, vast. He nodded. It's peaceful, I said. <laughs> Go deeper. Peace arises from this place. I did. It's still, unmoving, timeless. He smiled and nodded. It's deathless, fearless, immutable. Does this place come and go, he asked. I smiled. No, I said without hesitation. It's beyond time. Kelly nodded. That is your experience now, here? I nodded. Show me, he said. Show me without words. And so I leaned in. I snapped. Does this place come and go? He repeated. No. I was absolutely certain of my answer. Who comes and goes? I do. 
I was amazed at the answer. But this place is beyond just me. This is the space out of which I arise. From this place, he said, can anyone make you angry? So I thought of my girlfriend, <laughs> who made me angry in the most infuriating of ways. And the state of consciousness that I had just inhabited, it was just here, was gone. <laughs> and it collapsed. And so I nodded. Can anyone make me angry? Well, yeah, someone can make me angry. I mean, I was just telling you the other day, I mean, she said so this one, so yesterday, and so I start to talk. And Junpo takes this, this thing, and he strikes me across the temple. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns my head away. And so I'm sitting now looking at the floor, and it's very painful. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that this old geezer <laughs> had just hit me. Me, 20 years, 15 years at the time, Shaolin Kung Fu training, a trained tournament fighter, Philly, native. He hit me. <laughs> 30 years as junior. And, and then something really serious came up. My, my Catholic school teachers used to hit me. They used to hit me too. And they used to hit me because they too knew better. And so as I sat there, and this all rose in a flash, I felt rage, real rage arising, indignation, that he would dare hit me that hard. And so this, this feeling boiled up, and I thought, you fucker. <laughs> <clears throat> and so I raised my gaze to him defiantly, forcefully, and I was angry. And what greeted me froze me in my place. Jumbo had tears in his eyes, and he leaned in so close that our noses almost touched. I could feel his heart. I could feel his compassion towards me, feel his deep desire to have me get what he was trying to show. There was no smugness. There was no judgment. There was no patriarchal zeal or arrogance. There was only love and devotion and complete service. Speaking very slowly, his voice trembling with emotion, he asked me again, Brother, he whispered, Brother, this is life and death. Get this. Can anyone make you angry? And in a flash, I saw it. I had chosen anger when he struck me, but he had struck me out of service and out of love. He couldn't make me angry. My girlfriend couldn't make me angry. Only I could make me angry, no matter what came my way. Anger was the choice, it was the habitual reaction, but he had slowed down that reaction, allowing me to see what was happening in my own mind. As a martial artist, I knew that an angry warrior was a dead warrior for the simple reason that anger overwhelms logic and reason, causes mistakes in the ring or on the streets. In Kung Fu, anger is channeled into deep clarity and presence. But I didn't see that it was the same in my intimate relationships, that the same principle was true with my girlfriend, my parents, my friends, myself. My girlfriend could never, ever, ever make me angry. Only I could do that. I understood for the first time in my life where Christ was coming from, his state of mind when he said, do good unto those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone strikes you on one cheek, turn to him the other also. What do you really feel? He asked me. I care. I care so much about her, I said. What else? I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'll lose her. I was amazed at how close to the surface those insights were. How much I've been fighting back tears. So you're afraid and you care deeply 
and yet you react with violence. Does that make any sense to you? I shook my head slowly. It doesn't make sense, especially if no one can make me angry but me. Kelly sat back and a large smile came to his face. That's right, Baba, he said. That's right. That insight, that feeling of deep love and gratitude at being struck, was only possible because of this vast, empty, quiet, fearless, and timeless place. From this place, anger was inconceivable, not as an idea or a philosophy of peace, but as a lived reality. There simply was no room for anger in such vastness. Kelly worked with me for another 45 minutes before we parted company, but I was so shaken from what he had shown me that I forgot to say goodbye, forgot to offer him a donation for his services, forgot to shake his hand or hug him, forgot very nearly how to get back to Boulder. <laughs> anger had so long been a part of who I was. I was angry at my upbringing, angry at the Catholic Church of my youth, angry at my bank account, angry at my girlfriend, angry at the world, and most of all, angry at myself. What would it mean to live in a world where anger was inconceivable? So, that was when I kind of got the teachings, a little bit. <laughs> and so about a year later, Junpo calls me. And I'm at a coffee shop. And he says, hey, I, I think I might want you to write my life story. How about I fly you out to Massachusetts and we'll spend two weeks together. We'll talk about the life, if you like it, if you want to do it. What do you say? I said, yeah, I'm interested. <laughs> so he flew me out. And we had this beautiful two weeks and where he shared his entire life with me. And this life... The life that's detailed in this book is, is really beyond belief. Starts in Wisconsin. There are stories from India, the guru era, Swami Garbala. There's life as a major LSD manufacturer in the Bay Area, the start of the counterculture movement. There's meetings with the Grateful Dead and Alan Watts and the kind of who's who of spirituality. There's a life on the run living underground, hiding from the DEA for five and a half years, training with Trumpka, personally, Suzuki Roshi, personally, Edo Shimano Roshi, Patabi Joyce. There's stage four throat cancer that he survives at 64 years of age and bankruptcy. Unbelievable, and trust me that that's the highlights. And I get handed this story, this, this gift gets handed to me. And so I leave Massachusetts and I had a choice. I came back to Boulder. It's, it's 2009. I'm 36 years old. And I realized that this was not a story that I could write on nights and weekends and when I had spare time. That the same kind of devotion and all chips in life that Junpo's led, the same sort of devotion and dedication that he's shown to his life, the story demanded that much as well. So I sold my home in Philadelphia. That was kind of my retirement. Divested all my savings, put everything I had into a cash account, and I lived off the money. And I created this book. And so to me, what this is really is about, it's about living your life. It's about not living in regrets. No matter what happens with this book, I have no regrets. It was worth every penny. And it was my honor. And, and it's also, this is about waking up in the middle of the messiness of this moment. I mean, this, this is the story of awakening. It's a story for all of us. It's our story. It's our book. And it's our life. Yeah. So, I think I'll take myself off the hot seat a little bit <laughs> and ask Junpo to come up and we'll do a, a little Q&A and then uh, a book signing. Would you be so kind? <laughs>